Loot boxes are video game related purchases where the outcome is dictated by chance. And they came under scrutiny for their similarity to gambling and the lack of regulations means that this type of gambling is available even to the youngest of children. But who's the most affected and what does it all mean? Let's find out. First, let's summarize what loot boxes are. If you're not a gamer, there's a chance that you've never heard about loot boxes or loot crates or price crates, which are basically just different names for the same concept. And loot boxes are a type of consumable item in video games. They come in many shapes and forms, they don't necessarily have to be boxes. It can be boxes though, but it can also be crates and cases and card packs or shards and even eggs. The important thing about loot boxes is that you don't know what's inside and you need a key to open them. So you don't actually know what's inside. Sometimes the keys can be purchased with in-game currency, but often it is real money. Sometimes you can even get them for free, but these are often given to players to familiarize them with the concept and get them hooked into the whole mechanics and make them buy more later. Typically, a loot box is a type of monetization. It's a way that the company that created the game can extract money from their product. Loot boxes that drop during the gameplay and then the player can buy keys to open them later are based on gacha systems, which is a type of gambling in Japan I might talk about in a different video. But in the basic form you can imagine these gacha machines as these vending machines where you throw in money and you get something small in return. And the difference between a typical American vending machine in your parking lot and these Japanese gachas is that the vending machines usually just sell crap for kids and Japanese ones actually have some value. And in loot boxes, there's a rarity hierarchy to the items. And of course, you as a player mostly hope that this time you will be lucky and you will get that rare sword, that rare armor, that awesome gun. And the items included in loot boxes can and often are items that can help you win the game. For example, better weapons or power-ups. In this way, loot boxes kind of introduce this pay-to-win mechanics to a lot of games. But the items can also be purely cosmetic, so you could customize your character more. Games are full of loot boxes, mostly MMORPGs and free-to-play mobile games. Some games that feature loot boxes you probably heard of even if you don't play games at all. And these are for example Counter-Strike or Pokemon Go. But first let's take a quick look at the history of loot boxes. Where did they come from? Where did they go? Got a nice care for your character is probably not what you were hoping for. Now, loot boxes most likely originated in Japan, as the first loot box system known to man is Gatchapon Ticket from MapleStory, a popular Japanese MMORPG. And remember these gacha machines I mentioned earlier? Great! Now you can interact with them in games. The ticket was introduced to the game in June 2004 and it could be yours for only 100 Japanese yen. And 100 Japanese yen is about 64 cents as of writing this script. Inflation neglected. And this gachapon ticket was soon followed by Chinese CT in 2007 and Puzzles and Dragons in 2011. And at this point, loot boxes were introduced as a form of monetization for free-to-play games, as people struggled to buy like the titles, but microtransactions could make games more affordable. And that is, of course, until you get addicted and you spend a fortune on them. In the Western world, one of the first games to include loot boxes was FIFA 09, which came out, surprisingly, in 2009. And thanks to this update, the player could create a team of some special football players from card packs and then follow Valve with this Team Fortress 2 in 2010 and many more followed afterwards. Yay, gun is grinding! Welcome microtransactions! And of course, these boxes have to be attractive. They are designed to captivate the player who might be excited about the prospect of having uh, the loot. And not only that, but the loot is often hidden in a super cheerful and colorful box and the whole screen is celebrating your success. And when you finally open it, there's confetti and fireworks. Your monkey brain can't help but feel excited. It's the primal confetti instinct deep within us. But whatever the graphics represent, you can be sure that the company invested a lot of money to make the process as addictive as possible. 
And some interfaces are even inspired by real-life slot machines or roulette wheels. And they even employ similar tactics, such as variable ratio reinforcement schedules. And this basically means that the player gets their words at unpredictable intervals, so this encourages the repetitive behavior, just like in gambling. Some other mechanics that can also be included in the process are so-called pity timers, and pity timers increase the player's chance to get a rare item if they have not received one in a long time. And it's a clever way to keep players engaged and hopeful, as the longer they go without a rare item, the better their odds are at getting one. But of course, these can feed fallacies and make the player more addicted, especially because they believe that the good things will come. Plus, pity timers encourage bug buying, because, you know, one of these boxes is sure to have something rare. And of course, when your keys run out, you can be sure that there's going to be this huge ass button that will inform you that you can actually buy more. No, when the player gets the items, they can wear them to show others that their character is better than them, or they can actually use them in games, for example, weapons, and they can actually be better than other players or sell them. And there's an entire economy here with official and unofficial markets where items can be traded. Now, this not only affects the game's economy, but also players' behavior, as some aim to profit from these transactions and want to make a living based off getting rare items. Loot boxes rarely take into account what the player already owns, which can lead to frustration and hope and compulsion and the need to buy more and, you know, duplication of items in your inventory. And let's not forget about seasonal loot boxes. Seasonal loot boxes are limited edition and they introduce a time-sensitive element to the whole game. They create this sense of urgency to, you know, get now or regret later. And it's a classic marketing tactic to induce FOMO, the fear of missing out. But remember, it might seem like a good investment, but for the most part, it's just another spin in the cycle of addiction. And while we speak of addiction, let's take a look at it. It's the addictive property of loot boxes that is often criticized when it comes to loot boxes. Getting and opening loot boxes can become a form of compulsive behavior, and compulsive behavior is a term which describes performing an action persistently and repetitively. And while almost anything can be done compulsively, some actions are more likely to trigger compulsive behavior than others, and gambling is one of them. Plus, the payout ratio can be programmed in such a way that the payout happens just at the right time to tickle that itch just as slot machines do. Most research I've read concludes that loot boxes are akin to gambling in several areas, including structural and psychological effects. This variable ratio schedule of reinforcement is a positive reinforcement framework that is one of the leading causes of acquisition of persistent behavior, including gambling and perhaps loot boxing. Players' behavior is reinforced by small rewards, and the idea that one day the reward will be big. Getting these small rewards produces dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter that plays a huge role in addiction. And dopamine is one of the major neurotransmitters in the reward system of your brain. In this particular case, the reward is unknown, although the player hopes for the best. And to get the reward, they have to repeat the action until it becomes a habit. Another concept that makes loot boxes predatory is their tendency to abuse decision-making, cognitive biases and fallacies. For example, when the player wants to try just one more loot box to make up for the loss they experienced from the previous loot boxes. And this is a predatory behavior that can lead to purchasing more loot boxes than the player originally planned. Another fallacy that can be applied both to gambling and to loot boxes is the gambler's fallacy where in case of loot boxes, the player might believe that something valuable is due because they did not get any valuable items for some time now. And even though the process is random, the mind still kind of works this way. And don't forget that some loot boxes actually use the pit timers mechanics, so it kind of fits into the whole fallacy. And believe it or not, some companies even have patents for player behavior tracking to adjust these offerings. And the third bias that I'm going to mention today is near-miss effect, which encourages the player to try again because this time they miss only by a small fraction. In slot machines, you can see the two cherries proactively aligning with the third before finally spinning to a banana. 
with loot boxes this can be done via funky animation that almost gets there except it doesn't and it's even been suggested that people who do not have gambling experience are more vulnerable to this effect. And one argument that could be made for loot boxes is that they are somewhat similar to booster packs for those card games where you call it cards blindly such as Magic the Gathering. And there was actually a case in the USA against these booster packs for their similarity to gambling, but it was not substantiated. In Belgium, loot boxes are exempted from gambling by law. And you could also argue that loot boxes are kind of like Caterex. And you know what? They kind of are. And there are actually three possible ways loot boxes and gambling can interact with each other. First, it's completely possible that people who already are problem gamblers in some way purchase more loot boxes. And we cannot also rule out the gateway effect of loot boxes to traditional gambling, although more research is necessary. More likely, there's this complicated relationship between gambling and loot boxing, and there's no strong causation of one because of the other. One study exploring the gateway effect found that almost 20% of respondents self-reported gateway effect or reverse gateway effect, so that means that loot boxes influence their gambling and vice versa. And the majority of people who reported this gateway effect also stated that they were under age when they purchased their first loot box. The people also provided reasoning and several reasons they listed were sensation-seeking, normalization of gambling-like behavior and addictive nature of both activities. There was also a subset of participants who reported that they actually started with loot boxes because they found them safer than gambling. Now, what makes loot boxes more similar to gambling than, for example, Kinder Eggs is the fact that players usually lose money. It's the same idea as with slot machines, where you get these payouts, but they don't really cover what you put in. Several papers concluded that loot box purchasing and gambling are related behaviors, and the association between problem gambling and loot boxes seems to be weaker for loot boxes that are completely free, a bit stronger for loot boxes that are purchased with in-game currency, and the strongest for the loot boxes where the players can actually sell the content of their loot boxes and make real money. Now let's take a look at some statistics and risk factors. Loot boxes are not just a niche feature. They are prevalent in all types of video games. About 56% of highest grossing mobile games and 36% of highest grossing Steam desktop games feature them. And I know that the numbers in the next section might be a bit you know, larger than you'd like, but that's due to the fact that there's no one master research done on this topic. And it is estimated that between 44 and 78% of players buy loot boxes and in the UK that about 25 to 40% of children and adolescents actually purchase loot boxes. And men seem to be more likely to engage in this behavior. And I'm not entirely sure if the authors actually took into account the demographics of games themselves. One of the huge risk factors is actually age. Well, younger players, especially young adults between ages 18 to 24, are more likely to buy loot boxes. Out of the Android games containing loot boxes, 93% targeted people aged 12 plus and 57% targeted people older than 7. And these numbers are even higher in China. A study I mentioned earlier, the one who explored the gateway effect, established that the majority of participants who reported the gateway effect were under 18 when they first purchased a loot box. Plus, people who self-reported addiction as a gateway reason to other forms of gambling had a mean age of 14 for their first purchase and 14.86 for the effect of normalization, which is basically the fact that loot boxes help them see gambling activities as somewhat normal. There's also a study that deals with children and adolescents, namely 8th grade and 11th grade. 26.6% of 8th graders reported that they did not play video games in the past year, but 48.5% who did reported that they did not buy any loot boxes, 10.3% reported that they purchased 1 to 5 loot boxes, 4% reported that they purchased 6 to 10 loot boxes, and 3.2% purchased between 11 and 20 loot boxes. Now, 7.4% reported that they purchased more than 20 loot boxes in the past year. So 24.9% 20, so of the 8th graders in this particular study bought loot boxes in the past year. 
And the numbers somewhat changed for 11th graders, where only 40% did not play video games in the past year, so 60% did. 43% did not purchase any loot boxes. 7.1% purchased 1 to 5 loot boxes, 2.8% purchased 6 to 8, 1.8% purchased 11 to 20, 5.3% purchased more than 20 loot boxes in the past year. So 17% of 11 graders in this particular study bought loot boxes in the past year. This particular study also found that the risk for adolescent gambling are consistent with other research done previously, such as victimization, substance use, and gender. But these researchers struggled to find clear connections between these risk factors and loot boxes, apart from gender. And the authors suggest that if loot boxes are like gambling, the risk factors might be different. And another risk factor is previous gambling experience. There is also a link between problem gambling and loot boxing. So if you are a person who likes to gamble or who does not like to gamble but does it anyway, you are more likely to spend more money on loot boxes. The link between gambling and loot boxing, and not the other way around, is stronger than known links between problem gambling and depression and major drug problems and comparable to the relationship between problem gambling and alcohol dependence. And it's important to highlight that correlation does not mean causation and further research is absolutely necessary to understand this relationship fully. So what can we actually do to minimize the harm caused by loot boxes? Let's take a look at some examples. Fortnite. Unless you live under a rock, you've probably heard about this game. Epic Games changed the design of loot boxes in Fortnite to make them somewhat more ethical by implementing this system called X-Ray Lamas. And with X-Ray Lamas, the player can see the content before purchasing it. The content is still randomly generated every day, so the element of excitement of not knowing what you're going to get is still there. But the player gets to find out what it is before buying it. This returns the purchase power to the hands of the player and makes them less likely to overspend and spend money on stuff they don't want. Blizzard completely removed loot boxes from their games Heroes of the Storm and Overwatch, presumably to avoid legal battles with different loot box regulations, but more on that in the regulations section of the video. It is important to ask what is the most harmful thing about loot boxes? Well, we cannot confirm that loot boxes are a gateway to gambling, although loot boxes and gambling share some characteristics. But what we can assess is that loot boxes can lead to overspending and that players should be protected from having their natural instincts exploited for money. And another way the harmful effect of loot boxes can be minimized is by removing the cash out features, which is what gives them real world value, as was implemented in the Netherlands. Which leads us to the next section, regulations. This will probably not surprise you, but different countries have different laws and regulations. In some countries, such as Belgium, loot boxes fall under the gambling law naturally, and in other countries, new legislation is needed to regulate loot boxes. Implementing a universal, worldwide regulation is next to impossible, although large areas can fall under the same regulations, and if I have to guess, European Union is trying to make a lot of regulations to protect its citizens. You might argue that this should be your personal decision, but let's not forget that in an ideal world, regulations are here to protect you and create a safe space for everyone, so you could live in a world where your instincts are not exploited for money. And also there's the question of whether it is even your decision when they exploit your instincts so much. But it's not only countries to make regulations, right? The three leading gaming hardware companies, Sony, Nintendo and Microsoft, will require paid loot boxes in games developed for their platforms to disclose information on the relative rarity or probability of obtaining randomized virtual items. This will help players make informed decisions about their spendings. And the question is, of course, how and where will this information be available to the player and how difficult it will be for the player to obtain it. So far, about 95% of highest grossing iPhone games actually do disclose probabilities of their loot boxes in China. However, some don't provide enough details or aren't accurate. And even so, even if these numbers could be somewhat useful to adults, I'm sure that many children and teenagers will struggle to visualize the concept, and even some adults. 
Different countries took different approaches, so the level of player protection is wildly different among countries. In Belgium, all paid loot boxes are considered gambling and are not available to its citizens. While in the Netherlands, you can spend whatever you want on loot boxes, but you cannot use any cash out features. And since loot boxes are in their infancy and the research is even younger, there are so many things we don't know. Not only things about like the links to addictive behavior, but also about treatment. For example, if loot boxes are akin to problematic gambling, how should they be treated? Should they be treated? Should there be a specialized treatment program or should we just put the loot box guys with the slot machine guys? And how can we minimize the harm? If we decide to put a max limit on month spending, where's the limit? What can be an exorbitant amount of money for some players is just pennies for others. Should we force companies to make players set their own spending limits and adhere to them? And this is not even a bad idea. There are some studies that state that problem gamblers appreciate having limits and that after reaching their limit, they go home, they don't find another casino to spend more. And people are usually open to regulations that they think make sense. A different policy could be a guaranteed reward system where players are guaranteed a certain item after they spend X amount of money, which reduces the reliance on chance or Quite possibly there could be like a shop next to the loot boxes, so the player could choose between the two. It's also quite possible that regulations should be different for child and adolescent players and for adults. But this can be hard to check and implement in many countries where players do not have to use their real ID to register for games. Which is by the way what happens in Korea, your gaming identity and your real life identity are tied together. But this doesn't happen in the western world. Research so far has found a link between purchasing loot boxes and gambling. The compulsion to buy loot boxes can lead to overspending and several countries have already taken action against loot boxes, while others are trying to figure out what to do with them. But a core question remains. How do we protect people from potential harm without infringing on personal freedoms? And to what extent are our choices influenced by sophisticated psychological triggers designed to maximize profits? As we wrap up our discussion about loot boxes, it's kind of clear that there are no easy answers. Future research could also focus on the impact of loot box mechanics on long-term financial habits, especially in younger players who are still developing their understanding of value and money. But now I'd like to hear from you. Do you have experience with loot boxes? Or do you know anyone who has gotten into trouble because of loot boxes? What are the policies you'd see as helpful to minimize harm caused by loot boxes? Let me know in the comments, and if you have any questions, don't be afraid to ask. But that's it for today's video. I hope you learned something new and useful and interesting, and if you're interested in addiction treatment and prevention, and the various biochemical, sociological and psychological aspects of addiction, follow my channel and see you in the next one. Thank you for spending your time today with me, and if you really enjoyed this video, let me know by liking it, or let others know by sharing it. Have a great day. Bye! Oh my god, it's another useless toy.